Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over this weekend's UFC card. And we're going to be doing it from a uh, DFS perspective first. And then I guess tomorrow we're going to go through a uh, through it from a betting perspective. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with this, the betting perspective is always very contrarian and, and quite a bit of fun. Uh, I already know where I'm going to be headed towards uh, picking for the uh, betting breakdown, but you'll just have to wait, I guess, either until later tonight or tomorrow to get that. Uh, we did have a week off um, uh, last week, so we're ready to get back after it. And for those of you that were not there, um, didn't see this, I did qualify for that uh, live final, which is uh, going to be June 24th. So uh, we're looking forward to that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually make it to the live final in Jacksonville, but I'll be fighting it out with, I guess there are 14 other entries for all the cheese. Um, if I can make it great. It sounds like a great trip, but um, let's put it this way. The live final trips are more for the, uh, more for the young that, uh, that don't work and all that stuff. I don't know if I could take four days off to go do that, but nonetheless, we did qualify, which is obviously a pretty good uh, achievement. So, this weekend, we have to talk about uh, uh, the most important bit of news that came in during the week was that Jamie Malarkey's fight uh, was was uh, was re rebooked from a situation where he was going to be about a two to one underdog to one where he is now basically a four to one favorite. And as we discussed before, when you know DraftKings once their salaries come out, they're just they're locked in. So they, you know, you do run the risk of this happening from time to time. So what happens is now you have Jamie Malarkey, who's priced as a two to one underdog at least, and he is basically a four to one favorite now. Uh, when you look at this on best fight odds, um, yeah, he's minus five hundred, or maybe minus three seventy five, four hundred, whatever it is. He's he's a, a theoretical lock here. Okay, so you got to play him in all your lineups, and, and, and the not to mention that he probably has you know a decent amount of upside. Also, um, he's I I would say honestly that he's probably the highest projected scorer on the whole slate uh, at sixty seven hundred, which is just you, know, you just have to play it. And if that makes playing GPPs you know less appealing to you, that's great. Uh, just so you, I mean, that's great. Then, then I apologize for that and then don't play. But one thing, one observation I will give you is that I do think that situations like this are actually under-owned. I mean, I, I really think that this, he should be theoretically 100% owned. Um, and he's probably only going to be about 70. So I feel as though any lineup that doesn't play him is just contributing to the rake. And I think that if you do play GPPs, you do want to play him in every lineup. Um, yeah, I mean, there's leverage to be had if you don't play him, but the, the math is just uh, is just a little rough. Okay, uh, it's just it's just a little rough to get the optimal without him in it. I mean, he's eighty percent to win, and not to mention the fact that he has an inside the distance problem of what, like minus one seventy or something like that. Um, it's not on this this site, but it's on one of the others. I mean, he's take a look at it. Um, malarkey in, inside the distance. She doesn't say it here, but it's it's minus something like minus one thirty, something like that, maybe a little more. So uh, he's a lock, uh, and you have to start your lineups with him. But what's interesting about this card is what this does to the rest of the slate. Um, I, I do think that it is a good GPP card, not for this fight, but for what it does to the rest of construction. Okay. When you have a $6,700 fighter who is a lock, what people do when they play, you know, the 150s or whatever they play, is they'll lock him in and then they'll run lineup builds. And what you'll get when you run lineup builds, when you have a $6,700 fighter locked in, is you free up all the salary to play pretty much whoever you want, uh, specifically the, the high price 9K and up fighters. So what you're going to get is a situation where basically everybody 9K and up is, uh, not to say over-owned, but they're just easier to get in. So they're going to be really, really highly owned. 
So the 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 idea in in a card like this is the way to get leverage if you want to play this if you want to try this is you want to find the best uh opponent of those 9k fighters okay that i believe is the best way to get leverage on a card like this is not to just try to fade malarkey but to realize what the malarkey play does to the rest of construction throughout the industry and try to get leverage off of the uh off of the wreckage so to speak so we'll get into it but let's just say for example we just sort these by salary that you know silva santos gordon elliott or whatever are like really popular and they will be not necessarily because they're a great players but because you can get them in so really really easily some people will play these guys just because again they'll set a max you know a min not min salary but they won't set a max salary of um they won't set a sorry a min salary below fifty thousand, and they'll sometimes get a min salary of forty nine five, and you'll end up with with all these lineups with 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 two nine Ks or maybe even three nine Ks, like for example. So that's what I would suggest is we you, we try to find the best pivots or the best leverage, the best opponents to these nine K fighters. So I think overall that's what you'd like to um, attempt to do. Um, all right. Let's go through kind of fight by fight. And you know what I want to start? I want to start actually with the main event. So you have Kari Kara France against Amir Al-Bazi. And the, the, the line is pick them. All right. And the uh, the salary is is priced at pick them. You know, Kara France is 8,200. Al-Bazi is 8,000. But the fight, despite the fact that the fight is pick'em, I feel as though, not even feel as though, I've noticed that I would say about 90% of the experts are picking Kai Kara France. Um, which is up, and this is listen, this is more for the betting breakdown portion, but that type of thing is 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 worth noting, you know, like even though it's pick'em. I can't find anybody who's who's picking the Albazi side straight up. And, and the reason for that is, well, there's two things. Number one is you have this narrative that that Albazi has faced the lower competition, and he has. You know, and, and you have this narrative that Kara Kara France has been in five-round fights. He's fought Moreno twice and whatever it is. Um, and the other thing is that you have this more advanced take that Kaikara France has elite level takedown defense. And this is a very important point, okay? Because the way these fighters are fighting, Kaikara France is going to be striking based, meaning he's going to either win the fight based on volume and a decision or by knocking him out. And Albazi is going to win this fight based on his takedowns and his ability to wrestle and get him to the ground and either finish him there or just rack up a ton of DraftKings points over five rounds and not getting a finish, right? And the the, the idea is that people are, I won't say convinced, but people even through their, their intelligent analysis are noting that Kai Kaur France, he has incredible takedown defense. So his, you know, his skill set is going to, um, so what is it going to neutralize Albazi's strength? And so Albazi's probably a poor play. But the, remember, we're talking about DFS here. We're not talking about betting. What we have to presume for the purposes of DFS is that these win odds are accurate. Okay. So even though you think that that Ty Kara France's takedown defense is going to give him an edge here, the fact of the matter is, is that this line is pick. And the fact of the matter is, is that if this is important. If Albazi wins, he is scoring a ton, right? And I had this discussion regarding a little, a much different case, but when Marab did, did when Marab did Havishvili was fighting Peter Piotr Jan, and there were people that were saying that Peter Jan was a was a lock, he was a good play, but that that wasn't the point. The point was was that. If Marab won, which he rated to do about 40% of the time, he was going to score through the roof. And, and likewise, here, 
if in fact al Bazi does win, I don't know if he's going to, but if he does, he's going to score really well. Where if France wins, is he going to score really well? I, you know, I think he might as well, because if he wins, he's either going to get a KO, you know, or he'll get a volume-based decision, which obviously that's not going to score great, but over five rounds, it's going to score, you know, just plenty. So I do think that this main event is a uh, is is a is a good fight to target, and it is kind of a difficult fate. But I will say that I, that I think Albazi is definitely the best of the two plays from a DraftKings perspective, because if Kai Carfres does get kind of like a like a decision win, can't promise you he's going to score a hundred. But if Albazi gets a decision win or any kind of win, really. I mean, he's got to score 100 because he's going to have to have at least, at least four or five takedowns to win this fight, okay? Where Kai Kara France doesn't have to score that many points to win the fight. So that's the first, uh, are those two, uh, is the main event. Let's now, let's, let's go from, I guess, the, we'll go from the bottom up. You know what? Let's, let's do it another way. Let's eliminate, want to eliminate some fights? You know what? Let's first talk about the Elise Reed uh, Jean Frey fight because again, this is one I think you can eliminate pretty quickly. Um, women's MMA, not that it's women's MMA hey, doesn't mean I won't bet it, but the inside the distance props are just so poor. I mean, we'll look at it. You have Elise Reed, who is her inside the distance prop is minus four plus five hundred or something like that. I mean, this this fight's just not finishing, and I actually believe if, if there's anybody that's got more DraftKings upside of the decision. Well, I was about to say it's Jin Frey, but is she because at least Elise Reed does have poor takedown defense. But I guess Elise Reed could win a, a high volume based decision, kind of like a, one of those good Angela Hill performances where. Maybe she gets like 150 significant strikes and, and scores decently. So I was going to just kind of toss this fight out, but I think considering the fact that I'd rather kind of fade the 9Ks for the reasons I kind of mentioned at the outset, maybe like a low-owned, you know, fight like this is going to actually be useful in GPP. So, so I'm actually not – I was about to – this by the side of the mouth. All right, let's take a look at some others. Uh, let's go from the bottom up now. Philippe Lins versus Maxime Grisham. You have 8,800 versus 7,400. So what we'd expect to see is probably, I don't know, win odds of about 160 or so. Let's take a look. Wow. So Grisham is actually only a minus 130. And with the VIG, it's minus 120. So you're actually getting... So pretty damn good line value on Philippe Lins. Um, not to mention, I have seen most of the takes discuss how Grishin is probably the, the better the better play here. So maybe, is it possible Lins can go low-owned even with line value? Um, I doubt it. But but if so, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, Lins is clearly the better play here. I mean, unless there's some inside the distance prop I'm unaware of. I mean, Grishin's not a wrestler or anything like that. And Grishin is low volume. I mean, he's Grishin inside the distance plus 300. I mean, I definitely feel as though Linz is the better play. As a matter of fact, Linz's inside the distance prop is not much worse. I mean, he's like plus 320, which is not bad for this price tag. So yeah, I'm, I'm in. I think Linz is a very, very strong underdog. Here. Uh, we talked about Malarkey. All right, Demond Blackshear versus Luan Lacerda. We'll go backwards. So if, if Lacerda is a minus 150, you're expecting to see maybe, um, I don't know, maybe again like 8,800, 8,700, something like that. And that's what you're getting, 8,700 versus 7,500. Uh, let's look at the inside the distance prop. For a, this to be a good fight, for, um, you want the either – a lot of grappling upside, or we're looking for a Lacerda maybe to have a maybe a plus 130 inside the distance, maybe Blackshear, maybe a plus 330 or something like that. Um, 
you do have both of these fighters with some grappling upside, though. Um, I don't know exactly which way it's going to go, but they, they both do, you know, they're both pretty skilled as far as, well, I say skilled, but they both do look to takedowns and grappling to some degree. So there is a little upside there. When it comes to the inside the distance prop, though, let's take a look. Let's see if it's close. That's what we need. Black's your inside the distance plus like a million. Actually, I want to look at another site for this. Lacerda inside the distance is, as a matter of fact, let's, let's go to the other side. Let's go to fight odds. Fight odds. We don't want this one. We just, we don't want the, here we fight. We're going to go to this one. Okay. For Lacerda Blackshear, you have Lacerda inside the distance is plus 200. And that's just not going to be good enough. Blacks, you're inside the distance. Boy, oh boy, I, we're going to get to the betting breakdown, but this looks uh, this looks pretty tempting. It's really 10 to 1. That can, Here's like plus 6.5 over here. It's not, it doesn't seem like a bad bet, but we'll get to that as far as betting goes. You you can't bet it. Uh, you can't play it in D, DFS. These numbers are just too poor. I think Lacerda inside the distance, uh, I think you need closer to plus 130 for it to be a good line uh, to imply that it finishes often enough. So I, I think this fight's probably, if anything, maybe a little bit of Lacerda, which actually makes some sense, you know, because again, if I want to fade these really popular nine Ks, maybe you do want to get into this range a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to put Lacerda as my, uh, as a decent play. Uh, so we're not going to play black Shear, but we will put Lacerda in the mix. We talked about Reed and Jinyu Frey. Um, okay, John Castaneda against M. Gufrov. So 8,400, 7,800, we're expecting to see, you know, maybe a minus 130 or so. Let's take a look and see what these odds are. Yeah, that's about right. Let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. I mean, there's really not a lot of takedowns, really. We're looking for a, a good inside the distance prop. It's not bad. I mean, Castaneda plus 230. Gufrov plus 300. Let's go back and forth. Let's actually take a look at both of these. Both of these uh, sites here. In this one, we have... Mm, this one doesn't really say... Fight goes, yeah, this is a pretty poor, pretty poor prop site right now. But I guess it's just kind of poor. I mean, again, the only reason I would play this is again to 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 get different as far as the um the uh the pricing goes. But well, hold on, 8400 I, mean, I have to think that that's good enough, right? If He's plus one, plus two thirty-five. I mean, it's fringy. I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on it for now. But listen, in one fifty, yeah, you'll play it. But I don't know. And and Gafarov, he's on short notice. But from what I hear, he's he's in pretty good shape. So I guess he's a decent enough underdog. But I don't know. I think I think he's fringy also. So I'm, I'm going to make this fight a secondary target at best. All right, so Dante Mays against uh, Andre Arlovsky. You have Mays as an 8,500. Uh, let's take a look at the actual prices. Um, you actually have, yeah, Mays about minus 140, something like that. So the prices are about right. Let's take a look at the inside the distance props because I know Arlovsky's is almost infinite. Um, Arlovsky inside the distance is like plus 400 or so, and it's you know, you can't play that. Maze inside the distance at plus 220, I think is pretty reasonable. You know, compare that one. Hold on, so we have Maze inside the distance plus about 230 compared to Castaneda inside the distance plus about 230. I guess it's very similar. 
So I guess Castaneda and what's his name? Uh, Mays. I think they're both, I guess, I guess very similar, kind of like okay place, but not priorities. Um, I think both of them, I think that Mays does have some takedown upside. Um, I guess Castaneda sort of. So I guess, I guess both these fight, both these fighters are, are pretty even. Uh, and I would probably consider them. Uh, they're not my main priorities, but I think they're okay. Uh, as a, with respect to Arlovsky, his inside the distance prop is too poor. Uh, I'm not going to be playing. And now we kind of get into some of this stuff. Well, we actually, we'll get into the, these nine Ks in a minute. Let's first look at Zaleski Dos Santos against uh, Nurmagomedov. You have a pick em price tag as far as uh, betting odds. And you have Dos Santos is a little bit of a favorite implied as far as DraftKings go. So I guess it's a tiny bit of line value in Nurmagomedov. Um, but overall, it's pretty efficient. Now, with this fight, you need to have probably an inside the distance prop of about, uh, like I said, plus 250, something like that. In the absence of that, you want to have some takedown upside. And I think Nurmagomedov does have some takedown upside that you can, you know, rely on as you know part of your win condition. So I think he's probably a decent play. Let's take a look at the at the uh, Zaleski props, though. Zaleski inside the distance is plus what two twenty again. That's that's very similar to the guys that we just mentioned. You know, very similar to Mays. Very similar to Castaneda. I think all three of those are very, very similar. Um, and Nurmaga Medov has a poor inside the distance prop, but, um, I mean, it's a really poor inside the distance prop, but he does have some takedown upside. But let's let's, let's investigate that a little bit more. Um, you know, we have one takedown, these three fights. I mean, uh, I think that, that the side is probably... Uh, Dos Santos. Um, but I think it's interesting. I think that Dos Santos with Castaneda, with um, Dos Santos, Castaneda, and the other 8,300, I forget now. Um, Dantel Mays, 8,500. I think those are all very, very similar. I think you can honestly take whichever one of those is the lowest stone. And how you know that? I mean, you'll look at my updated uh, ownership projections as we get closer to lock. All right, so now we have Karina Silva versus Catherine uh, Souza. So here's the first one you might want to take a look at. Okay, again, this is this is dangerous, but I think this is what you have to do. I think you have to look at the Tim Elliott, Katarina Silva, Jared Gordon, Alex Caceres, and was that it? And and Willie Santos, and figure out which of these you want to try to you know take the other side. So let's just kind of, let's start comparing these. So first you have Kareem Silva. She's 9,300. Listen, there's, there's no question that you can play her, you know, if you want. And at 9,300, you know what you're going to need? You're going to need um, a inside the distance prop of about pick them and some grappling upside. She does have some grappling upside. And actually her inside the distance prop is is pretty reasonable here. I think it's right about pick them, right? Let's see. Um yeah, Sylvia inside the distance is about Pickham. So she fits the bill, you know, uh, so she is a good play. Um, so let's take a look at the other side of this. Let's look at, at, um, at uh, what's her name? Sousa? Sousa have any kind of inside the distance prop here? I mean, not really, but you really don't need it. You know, like Sousa just needs to win. Okay. So, like, if Sousa wins, you get, like, all kinds of leverage. And what she has going for her is, number one, I mean, she's plus, oh, she's only plus 190. You know what I mean? Like, and when you account for the VIG, she's maybe plus 170. So, she's going to win the fight about 35% of the time. So, if she wins the fight 35% of the time, getting all this leverage against Silva I mean, I, th I think you should shuffle your lineups and player. I mean, I, I know it's kind of kind of rough, but I really think that that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and, and we'll get to the other shuffles. Obviously, we'll get to the other shuffles in a minute. Um, 
Now, again, in, in Linus, where you don't play Souza, you can play Silva, right? I think she is a good play. But I think one of these fighters, you're going to have to play the other side. If you want to listen in GPPs, um, Tim Elliott versus Victor Altamirano. Um, you know, he's 9K and he's got all the narratives going with him. I mean, like it's found out his wife cheated on him, this whole thing. He's going to take it out on Victor Altamirano. I don't know. And then you also have the other part of it, which is you have the veteran savvy. And people want to play him. And uh, not only that, but. He can get takedowns. That seems to be the case. So he's got upside here. Um, we'll take a look at the inside the distance prop. You have um, Tim Elliott. Uh, inside, so inside the distance prop is pretty poor. That's the problem. He's plus 400 or so inside the distance, which is definitely what you don't want to see out of this. But he does have some takedown upside. So I actually feel as though he's going to probably be the lowest owned of all these nine K's um, between, and we'll get to Santos in a minute. So I think that like in those lineups where you fade one of them and you do want to like spend up for another nine K, I think you could play Elliot because I do think he's going to be lower owned because of these internals. Uh, Victor Altamirano, I actually think he's a pretty decent play from a betting perspective, but, but um, we'll get to that later. Um, but as far as, DFS, the problem here with picking him, again, is because is that you're not really getting the leverage. You know, like, uh, listen, his inside the distance prop, I guess, is reasonable. Let's take a look. Um, Altamirano, that's not even, it's like plus 600. So all you're getting is your win equity. And when you play a guy like this for win equity, you really want to have leverage. And, and, and as I just mentioned, the Tim Elliott side is not going to be that popular. So... In the absence of of of, of a popular uh, play that you're trying to be, you really want to have upside in your underdogs, and and I just don't see that without Altamirano here. So, um, I, I'm probably gonna you know not prioritize Altamirano here. All right, Jim Miller against Jared Gordon. So it's another one. I mean, he's nine k. Uh, Jared Gordon or eighty nine hundred, pretty close. But what's interesting is when you look at the inside the distance prop, it's kind of funny. Jim Miller actually has a better inside the distance prop than Jared Gordon. Like you look at this, Jim Miller, you can only get like plus 230 to finish. And Gordon, you can get like plus three, 350. So from a DFS perspective, it's pretty clear that Miller is the better play than Gordon. I just wonder if that's going to drive his ownership up. The, the thing is, though, is that I don't think it will because, again, he's not a better play than uh, Malark. So unless you want to play both cheapos like that, I don't know how popular Miller is going to be. Um, who am I kidding? He's gonna, they're going to play him. He's going to be like 30%. Um, now, with respect to, to, again, to Gordon, I mean, his just internals look like really, really poor. Now, he could sort of get takedowns, maybe, but he's more of a clinch guy than a takedown guy. So part of me wants to say that, that he is a really good pivot. Gordon up here, and maybe I will end up playing him. Um, but Miller is a good play, not because of the leverage, but Miller is a good play literally because of internals. And his plus 220 inside of distance, that price tag is just way, is just way too big. All right. Um, Alex Caceres versus, and we still haven't gotten to, why do I keep forgetting about Willie, Willie Cow? We'll get to him in a minute. So Alex Caceres against Daniel Pineda. Um, I don't know, it's like 180. Is he 9K? Pretty close, 8,900. Uh, we'll look at the inside the distance prop here because there's not that much takedown upside. For Caceres, inside the distance, plus 200. Again, it's kind of kind of weak. I mean, it's not really that great of a play. Um, Pineda inside the distance, plus 200. I think this is really, really reasonable. So I think that Pineda is actually the better play than... Um, than uh than Caceres here. So Pineda is another good underdog at 7,300, which is kind of crazy. Um, all right, let's go to this Willie Cat fight. Um, so this one is is the I think that that Santos 
is probably going to be the highest owned fighter on the slate. Um, it's either going to be him or Silva, just because you can get to them that really easily and, and their internals are really strong. Like you look at Santos, I mean, his inside the distance prop, you have, first of all, he's minus 200. And Santos inside the distance is minus 115 or something like that. It's just as good, if not actually better than, let's take a look at what's your name again. Um, where is, um, what's your name? Silva. Silva. Where'd she go? Oh, there's Silva. Silva inside the distance. It's about the same. Okay, so, Sil so Silva and, and Willie Cat are very, very similar. Okay. They are the best plays at 9K, and they're the best, probably best projected plays with the exception of Malarkey, right? And Malarkey, again, whatever. We, we talked about him already. So the question then is is which one of these fighters do you fade? And I don't mean fade, I mean just go against. I mean, let's let's take a look. See, because here's the thing about his opponent, about Santos's opponent. Johnny Munoz is junior. His inside the distance prop, I think, is pretty non-existent. It's probably a plus 500. We'll take a look at it. Um, it's actually not that bad at plus 350. But the other thing is that he's got some takedowns. And... And Santos has given up some takedowns. And I feel as though that, that Munoz Jr.'s win condition, his, it's got to be a combination of either that finish equity or he's going to get takedowns. He's not going to win a decision without the takedowns. Okay, So I actually like Munoz as, as a good underdog here. All right. Um, is Santos a good play? Of course. Is is Is... What's his name? A good play? Uh, uh, what's, what's your name? Uh, Silva, a good play? Of course. But what are you going to do? You know, like if you played Silva, when you're playing Malarkey, right? Silva, um, where'd he go? Silva, Santos, Malarkey. I mean, how are you going to get different enough? You know what I mean? To make this work. This combination is going to be like, like zillions duped, okay? The only way I think that you could play a lineup like this is to leave a lot of money on the table. Like you can't play the man, but you just can't do it. Okay? Then, then, then you definitely can't do it. What, what you, the only way you could do it is you played something like, like Pineda, just as an example, Linz, and then maybe like, Susan or something like that. No, no, Susan were already playing. Uh, oh, wait, yeah. Maybe some Murano. We don't want, we don't, and Miller. Okay, so so if you did this, like, for example, like you played three you know, semi-decent looking underdogs, between Pineda, Linz, and Miller, and you left like 3,000 on the table, then you could play these three. But aside from that, you're, you're really just playing like, like Dupe City, Okay. So the way I would approach this slate is either doing something like I just did, like leave like lots of money on the table with those three plays or just shuffling in and out of leveraging against. Them. So like, like play Munoz instead of Santos. So you play Munoz, then you can play Silva, then you can play, um, uh, then you can really play whatever you want. Munoz, you're we're already playing Malarkey, and then even still, now you now you have nine K a man. Now you can do whatever you want. You want to play? You can end up playing Gordon in case Miller is highly owned. You could play Tim Elliott. And you could play you could play all these you know decent plays, or you could leave money on the table, whatever you want. Okay, um, and you are going to be I think different enough. Well, I mean. You got to have a couple of more slots. Like you can't just play Munoz and say, okay, now I'm different. If you're then you're going to go play Silva and Malarkey, et cetera, et cetera. I still think you're going to need another one. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe a Philip Linz, for example, or maybe a, like Miller's too easy. You know, maybe a Dante Mays or something like that. 
But once again, you are still going to leave money on the table if you do this. Okay. The only way I think you don't leave money on the table, like a decent amount, is if you do exactly. Well, how do you not leave money on the table? Well, I mean, you've played all these 8,700s. Like you play uh, Lacerda, who I thought was an okay play. We play, who are those other eight? Like Elise Reed, you could do something like that, you know. But overall, I do think it's a card where leaving money on the table is going to, going to make it work, okay? Um, but again, as far as dupes go, you cannot play, in my opinion, can't play Malarkey with the main event. Probably just that's it. Like if you play Malarkey with the main event, let's say you played Albazi, for example. But once you start playing Santos, like you're already too duped. Once you even start playing Silva, you're probably already too duped. I mean, can you do this? Can you play Gordon, Elliot? You know what I mean? Can you do something like this where you just fade both of those fighters? I think that's okay. You know what I mean? I think actually that's okay. Like if you, if you fade both Silva and uh, Santos, then you could play around with all this stuff. Um and I don't even think you need to play their opponents in a situation like that. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna fade just one of them, I would play the opponent. But if you're gonna fade both of them, then I don't think you have to. Okay. Um, and don't kid yourself, even a lineup like this is gonna be, you know, people are gonna get this also. So anyway, that's the deal. That's what happened with the malarkey. I mean, he's just kind of made it, so it's kind of difficult um to get unique, but we're gonna try. Um and that's pretty much it. Uh, hopefully we keep <laughs> keep the rest of these fights for the remainder. We shall see. Um, and stay tuned for the betting breakdown, which is coming either later tonight or tomorrow. That'll do it.